peasants that had maybe 20 cows instead of five, and they would be like the head man or whatever. But everyone was sort of on a level, and therefore there was an unwritten law of, of non-harming. The Slavic word for a village community is a mir, which also means peace in both Russian and Ukrainian and Belarusian variants of that. So the mir is we keep the peace amongst ourselves as a village, and we don't slaughter each other. Okay, so what went wrong was, um, okay, the next box we have to investigate here to understand fully is Marxism, number 72 in the humanist thing. To really understand this, we can't ignore the fact the Soviet Union had a Marxist-inspired revolution, which was in power for 75 years, approximately. Um, and what is Marxism? Okay, so I wrote a book about the esoteric origins of Marxism. And I was fascinated by this when I was growing up as a boy because my mother was a Marxist um, and a member of the British Communist Party. So, you know, it was like, um, and she was an intellectual, a French teacher, and she particularly liked the French communist tradition, the French Marxist tradition. And I would often ask, you know, well, what is it? What's it? So I discovered a lot. Um, and I eventually went on to read philosophy and at the University of London studied it in detail. But I've discovered there's, there's a couple of problems with Marxism that, that are not exposed in the conventional things, you know. Um, I never became a Marxist. I someone that believes that Marx provided the all and absolute answer to analysis of history. It's a sort of theory of history which attempts to explain all events in a particular modality. The bit that I couldn't accept, well, there were several things, but one I couldn't accept was the, the weddedness to materialism. Mar we have to understand that Marx and Engels wrote in the 19th century. They were wedded to a time of thinking when everything can be explained materialistically. Um, all our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, they're just chemical reactions going on. Um, uh, you know, you meet somebody, you fall in love, it's just hormones, and you can explain which hormones are doing it. Um, even the greatest composers, Beethoven, Bach, it's just chemical reactions going on in their brains that's producing nice music. Um, now, I found this a very um, limiting philosophy. I didn't accept materialism, um, because I found it didn't answer the deep questions. Why? Why are we here? What's the universe for? Um, you know, why, why are human beings endowed with such sophisticated minds? Um, and it was actually nursing old soldiers in Canada for four years as a 20-year-old and watching, seeing death for the first time. I began to realise there must be something more to life than just this one lifespan. And I began to look at evidence for the survival of the soul after death, the old idea of the immortality of the soul. And I came scientifically to believe that is the case. As a working hypothesis, I mean, I might be wrong, you know, I'm just a philosopher, but it seems to me most likely that, that all the traditions of the periodic table which affirm the spiritual nature of man must be based on something. Um, Graham Hancock would say that it's just based on the psychedelic experiences of our deep ancestors going back thousands of years, but, but in my own experience of psychedelics, I felt that it revealed the immortality of the soul. And when I discovered that this is what Plato did in the Mysteries in Athens for a thousand years, the mysteries of Greek philosophy were premised on this revelation of the immortality of the soul, I felt, well, okay, so that's, that's now we can, I think, agree on that. Um, and you don't have to take psychedelics to have the experience. So, <clears throat> so therefore I rejected Marxism as an as a ideology. Um, but I was nevertheless very interested in it as a, as a phenomenon, as a thing. And I could accept certain elements of what it was saying. Like it seemed to be wanting to promote peace. And in the 70s and 80s, when I founded Philosophers of Peace, you know, I was talking to Russian philosophers and went to Moscow, and they, they were saying they want peace. They seemed to be nice people. You know, they said, no, we're humanists. We, we like Marx because he was learned in ten languages and a very great scholar and did a PhD in philosophy, you know, we want to be part of European civilization. We're on the side of liberty. 
And I believed that. And certainly my mother's brand of Marxism was. These were intellectually advanced people. right? <clears throat> and so, yeah, if you're interested, read my book about <clears throat> the links between Marxism and Freemasonry. I discovered that Marx was moving in circles in Paris, <coughs> which were inspired by Freemasons, who were some of the most advanced thinkers of the day. And, um, <coughs> and also I speculate that he was aware of and a student of the Kabbalah, and that that had inspired his determination to uplift the most poor, the most downtrodden, the proletariat. <coughs> which, um, you know, communism after all was an attempt to get to get the proletariat not being enslaved and persecuted by the ruling classes. I mean, it started off as a good idea, I think. Um, <coughs> right, <coughs> so... What I would say, however, is that in the Russian variation, just as when Christianity reached Russia, it ended up torturing people and becoming an sort of ideology of state control, when Marxism reached Russia, it did the same thing. It's this weird <coughs> dialectic whereby something turns into its opposite. It's what Engels called one of the three laws of dialectics. Um, and when I went to the Institute of Philosophy in Moscow years later in met intellectuals and stuff. Um, we, you know, there's a certain irony in, in this process, but certainly what happened with Lenin is that he was not a trained philosopher. He was not, I would say, a true intellectual. He was a fanatical um, revenge artist who was still angry for the death of his brother, who'd been executed by the Tsar for taking part in revolutionary violence. Um, and Lenin swore a vow on his brother's grave to avenge it. And that's a sort of adolescent, angry thing, which then coloured his entire intellectual work after. So what he saw in Marx was a good way to undermine the entire system. Um, he saw that its materialism can undercut all the spirituality. And yes, there was lots wrong with the Russian church, but there were some good things. You, they'd had great thinkers like Tolstoy, who were visionary geniuses. But Lenin wanted to throw all that out. No, all idealism, he called it, he dismissed. And he actually sent them on a ship to out of the country. Most of the great philosophers of Russia were, were kicked out of Russia by Lenin. He said, we don't want those thinker types. I would have been put on the ship as an idealist. And so what he what it did was, was train up people with this really rigid, dogmatic... Um, interpretation of Marx and Marxism as perpetual class warfare. There's no peace between the ruling classes and the, the, um, the revolutionary vanguard of the proletariat, which is the Communist Party. It's war to the death. And he unleashed a reign of terror against the middle classes and the intelligentsia of Russia. Um, his, his chosen way of doing that was to arrest people in the dead of night and have them shot before morning just mass shootings, and tens of thousands of Russian dissidents, intellectuals, and even socialists, began to be shot under Lenin. Historians have pieced all this together. I mean, it's shocking, you know, especially for Marxists like my mother, sort of dreamy-eyed romantics, you know, thinking it's all Simon de Beauvoir and Sartre in Parisian cafes. No, it was blood, bloody basements with people being shot en masse. Um, and, any, and, and so what, what Lenin said is we have to have absolute power with the, with the communist Bolshevik party. And anyone that disagrees with us on anything is like committing treason and can be shot. So, I mean, you know, the idea of constitutional law out the window. Because, you know, if you come to me and say, no, no, you can't do that. You can't make us paint our farms red because we've been painting them white for 600 years and look we've got you know laws that say we can well no you're going to paint them all red and if you don't we'll shoot you that became the thinking of Lenin um, <clears throat> you know psychologists need to study this and that's where we go back to psychology why would a man you know go that crazy um, uh, you know <clears throat> 
one can study it. Um, but if you thought Lenin was bad, you know, he only shot a few tens of thousands in his day. He founded a thing called the Chaker, which was a secret espionage system, so that every village, every town in Russia had Chaker informants who would be out there prowling around, listening into lectures like this, you know, and arresting people and shooting them. But only a few tens of thousands in his day, which is still unbelievably far too many, right? Um, but when Stalin managed to take over, Stalin was the least intelligent, the least, the least good of all the Bolsheviks sitting on the Central Committee. He was from Georgia. <clears throat> he was from a culture which was revenge-based. If you look at my wife, later tonight I'm going to come around and cut your eyes out. That kind of, you know, revenge mentality, right? And, and that's what Stalin uh, brought into the Bolshevik thing. So he liked Lenin and he, he pretended to be his, you know, loyal servant because he saw Lenin amassing all this incredible power. And he wanted that power. He'd been brought up in the streets of the Caucasus where you, you fought to win or you died. Some people say he at some point had been turned and become a, a Tsarist secret agent for the Ukraine, meaning he was a double cover agent infiltrating the Bolshevik party. I think there's some research needed on that. It's still possible. I, I suspend judgment because what he went on to do was to mass slaughter most of the communists of Russia. I'll come to that in a minute. You know, which only makes sense if he's a sort of pathological Okrana agent gone mad. Right? But nobody suspected it at the time. <clears throat> so he, he kept the minutes, he, he did the minutes of the Bolshevik meetings, which gave him a lot of power. He was able to see who would get the card, the card for party membership or not. He became a consummate bureaucrat. He kept a card index of all the people that were allowed to be members. And... <clears throat> If he heard they were talking against him as general secretary of the party, he turned to his secret service people, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the spy network, and he had them shot. Same old, same old, same as Lenin. Um, <clears throat> and the people he most hated were the Ukrainians. <clears throat> And this, so I'm coming back to why this is important to understand the war. The Ukrainians, they were a mixed bunch. Not all were communists. There was a communist tradition in Ukraine, but more they were like romantic nationalists, like Slovenians or something, or Poles. They liked their poetry, their music. They liked their church, but not a sort of torturing church. They tended more towards the Catholic tradition. They wanted to be more European. Their intellectuals came to France and, and studied in Rome and stuff. They translated classical works of Plato into Ukrainian. Um, <clears throat> and, and they were more heading in a kind of liberal, romantic, nationalist direction. There were some communists. And um, at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Ukrainians declared independence. They said, well, that's great, the Russian Empire's gone, thank God for that, we're going to go off and do our thing, thank you very much. But Lenin <clears throat> and Trotsky and the internal groups, Stalin, said, oh, no, you don't. You're staying in the new Russia, which will be called the Soviet Union, and it'll be run by us, the Bolshevik Party. And they sent agents into Ukraine, Bolsheviks, to basically round up the Ukrainian intellectuals who wanted freedom and who wanted an independent Ukraine, and they shot them. Just speaking out for Ukrainian independence or autonomy was regarded as a treason by the Bolsheviks. <clears throat> and this happened during the 1920s. And um, tens of thousands of Ukrainian thinkers, intellectuals, poets, artists, dreamy, romantic nationalists were, were executed by the Bolsheviks who said, and they spread this, this calumny against Ukraine. They said, they're all evil peasants who don't accept communism. They want private property. They want to own their farms and their farm machinery. They want to sell their produce. So Len Stalin thought up this brilliant idea called collectivization. All the Ukrainian farms would be nationalized. 
Nobody would own any land anymore. They'd be owned by the state. So let's say there's 10 farms around Boussac here, smallish farms, you know. Um, well, if they were collectivized, Soviet style, they'd all be united into one big farm, La Creuse North. And that would be owned by the state and run from Paris. And nobody who worked on the collective farm would own anything. We wouldn't even own a rake or a hoe, um, or a, let alone a tractor. The Ukrainian peasants resisted this. They said, this is trouble. We don't want this. We've been farming this land for a thousand, two thousand years. We know how to farm it. We love our land. You know, he's been farming that land in his family for like a hundred years. I remember his great-great-grandfather and stuff. <clears throat> Bolsheviks said, no, sorry, it's all going to change now. And they enforced collectivization. Some peasants fought back and the Bolsheviks shot them and gunned them down. There were a few struggles. Um, and Stalin was by now in supreme power in Moscow. And he was like grinning away in his office saying, how many Ukrainians did you kill today? Those reactionary, romantic, nationalist bastards. Um, so, then things got to a head. They still wouldn't really accept the um, collectivization of the farmland. They were still grumbling and wanted their own like small holdings. They knew how to farm. What went wrong was the only way they had of doing passive resistance was when they were all forced to work for the collective farm, they did the minimum. They sowed only a few of the fields. They didn't work properly. You know, when they owned their own land, they were happy. They produced loads of grain and, you know, they'd been farming it for years. Now they were forced to work on collective farms. As a revenge, they couldn't, like, they couldn't fight back. They'd lost that. The only thing they could do with dignity was just, like, go on like third working effort so that the crop yields became lower and lower and lower right um, now what, what the Bolsheviks should have done Stalin should have done when they saw the figures they should say oh god yeah okay you know you can't really force farmers to grow stuff so let's let them have a bit of freeholding you know let's liberalise here but instead he did the complete opposite and he said, no, we're going to force them. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is the most shocking bit. Um, and if they won't work, they'll starve to death. You know, it became a battle of wills. Stalin, you do it my way or you die. And the peasants saying, OK, then, well, we're not going to do it your way. And so the farmers had started hiding food um, to grow on little bits of private land in the forest. They'd hid grain and stuff. They were determined to, to like, be normal, right? But then the Bolsheviks realized that what was happening, so they sent brigade teams of indoctrinated Bolshevik um, of officials to go and raid all the villages of Ukraine and find every last bit of grain or stored food. They'd go into your kitchen, rip the cupboards out, steal everything, the flour, the cake, the eggs, all go. And they'd commandeer it. So their mission was to commandeer every scrap of food from the whole of Ukraine, which is larger than France. This was a massive operation. Um, the peasants were hiding food in their, in their walls, you know. So they discovered that if they had iron bars, they could poke through the walls and find it. And they started doing this in farms all over Ukraine. They captured the food. Um, what was still being grown was often sold for profit because the Bolsheviks wanted hard cash money. So they sold some of the grain that was around, didn't let the peasants feed with it, but sold it to Britain and America and other countries in return for dollars and pounds so they could buy weapons. So they could, you know, um, buy stuff they wanted for their consolidation of power as a military state. The result was that by 1931, Ukrainians were, were very, very hungry indeed. They hadn't been able to plant crops. There was no food growing in the fields. The Bolsheviks had confiscated most of their animals as well. Just out of sheer spite, they took their, their flocks of sheep and goats and their cows. 
And by this time, um, they then realised trouble was coming. So under a, another man who bears a lot of responsibility for this, Stalin's right-hand man, a guy called Kagav, Kaganovich, Kaganovich, um, they sealed the entire country. So no one was allowed out of the Ukraine at the borders. Um, every road out was blocked by Soviet troops, Bolshevik troops, who would shoot you if you tried to get out. They had also sealed the villages. So, so um, Bolshevik um, commanders sealed the village, like, say, Betet, you know. All the surrounding countryside was sealed, and every road out of the village was blocked. So I couldn't walk to Busak to try and get food because I'd be stopped. And if you tried to walk across the fields, you'd be found and sent back. Now, what happens if you're in a village which has no food, all the food's been taken, and you're not allowed to go out and find it, is you gradually starve to death. And that's what happened over a period of a year. 3.9 million Ukrainians starved to death. 3.9 million Ukrainians starved to death. Now, you know, this is a fact of history um, which is not taught in Moscow. It's not taught in Russia. It's, I don't think Putin probably even knows this because he's in this bubble of Russian, you know, Russian Orthodox superiority complex. Let's call it a psychotic syndrome. Where I believe that if, if, if they realised this history and what the Ukrainians had suffered at that time at the hands of these Russian Bolsheviks, they wouldn't have thought it's a good idea to invade them now. One of the reasons the Ukrainians are fighting so hard is that they don't want to repeat. They know what the Russians are capable of doing. My friend, the, Russian, the Ukrainian philosopher, I interviewed her recently about all this, and the Ukrainian intellectuals call this period the Holodomor, which means death by starvation. And the evidence, I'm reading a book by Anne Applebaum called Red Famine, I've read Tim Snyder's books um, called The Bloodlands, where they've documented now, historians have documented in detail, village by village. They've interviewed survivors. And, you know, these are now historically accepted facts by scientific historians, which raise huge ethical dilemmas. I believe that if, and this was done in the name of communism, that's what really annoys me more than anything. I mean, my mother was an ethical communist. It was a beautiful thing in her mind, you know. But this, this was done in the name of communism, in the name of Marx. And I find that utterly shocking. So it's, <clears throat> it's a total perversion of the ideals that should have been there. Um, to, to make a whole nation starve to death because, because you're, you don't like their romantic nationalism. Anyway, those are the facts, and um, I, there's a huge reading list that I've been working on the last six months and studying this stuff, and I did my degree in Russian East European history. Um, but, you know, it wasn't featured much, this Holodomor. It wasn't like a course we could do at the university back in the 80s. In Russia, I don't think anybody knew about it, um, very few. Um, it was sort of airbrushed out of history. And it wasn't until 1991 when the Soviet Union under Gorbachev eventually, you know, reinvented itself as a liberal kind of, we're going to take the Western road, they said, that Ukraine said, OK, thanks, we're off. And they declared independence in 1991, thinking, thank God, we've got out. <laughs> um, Gorbachev was a very good man. I heard him speak. When I went to Moscow in 1990, he was still president. I think he was an intellectual. He was a graduate in law of the University of Moscow, which I visited. I never met him personally, but I was, you know, I saw him in a, um, giving an interview with Dennis Healy, who was a British socialist MP at the time. You know, he was a thinking man. And Gorbachev really decided to end the Cold War. He, he disarmed the nuclear weapons of Russia, he, he did a peace treaty with America. He said, look, this communist capitalist thing is not worth blowing up the world over. He was an intelligent, common-sense guy. And um, 
it turns out, I've researched it, that he was born into a mixed Ukrainian-Russian family in the Ukraine. And he said in his memoirs that he remembers as a little boy the famine. Half the village died of starvation. He, he saw it. And the only reason his family lived is they had a cow. You know. So, so Gorbachev knew what I've talked about, the Holodomor. He knew how horrible it was. He knew that communism had committed these terrible mistakes. He knew that Stalin was an absolute devil figure. And he wanted a Russia that he believed in, of, of proper thinking people, humanistic philosophers, you know, to take uh, with a different view of Marxism, like a proper democratic, intelligent form of Marxism, not bayoneting and starving people to death. But what I've discovered, and I'm going to, we'll have a break in a minute, is that Putin never accepted Gorbachev's reforms. Putin belonged to a rearguard faction in the KGB, the inheritors of Ivan the Terrible's secret service that's always been there in, under Russian uh, history. The KGB were utterly ruthless, and it was them. I mean, they were called the Ogpu in the day, but they did the famine in Ukraine. It was them that was going around poking the walls and sealing the towns and deliberately massacring these people. That's what the KGB do, and, and Putin was their descendant intellectually. He was raised in a climate in Petersburg of gangland warfare, where the only ethics is, I kill you before you kill me. Um, and he only joined the KGB because it was the biggest gang in town in Petersburg. The other gangs weren't anywhere near as good as the KGB, so he joined them and rose up in the ranks. He became the head of Dresden, KGB office in Germany, spying on the West, stealing computers, stealing anything they could, breaking every single law, but that's what spies do, being ruthless. Um, <clears throat> and when Gorbachev did his reforms, perestroika and, and glasnost, which meant a sort of openness, which is when I went to Moscow and met amazing intellectuals, Putin was sitting away in his office in, in Dresden plotting revenge against everything Gorbachev stood for. It was a long-term strategy of revenge. He was going to put his cronies back in power and bring back Russia into the good old days of Stalin. And that's what we've seen since then. Anyway, that will stop there. We'll have a break, okay? Um, and then later we'll have some questions. Okay. <clears throat>